So uh, in lab yesterday, we started looking at or started talking about muscles and went through the uh, types of muscle tissue. Um, and uh, today, we're going to start into talking about muscles a bit more. Um, as far as what we're doing in yeah. schedule-wise, um, unit. That's weird. Um, it says unit seven there, but actually it's unit eight. Uh, so if you <coughs> clicked on, and I bless you, uh, I never uh, changed these things to say that say week to unit. But anyways, if you click on eight, you get to this one that says seven here. Um, and the chapter assignments in here, parts one, two, three, and four, are called muscle anatomy. And then the next week unit, whatever you want to call it, which again, the numbering's off there, um, is still about muscles. And its chapter assignments, part one, two, three, and four, are called muscle physiology. Um, so we're going to be spending a while on this chapter. And uh, you have two sets of assignments from the chapter, uh, which are set up in two weeks' worth of uh, assignments. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start by looking at the structure of muscles and, um, you know, so that's the anatomy stuff, which is what these first four assignments are about. And then we're going to, uh, actually we'll start talking about the physiology of muscle tissue uh, probably on Thursday, but uh, that'll continue on through next week. Uh, and so there's other assignments there. And actually, let me think about um, let's see. these are due yeah the 16th, um, and I'm pretty sure the physiology ones will be due that time too. Yeah. So all of the assignments, parts one, two, three, and four. Um, on the musculature are set to be due, uh, what did I say, November 16th? Um, because it's not really entirely possible to completely separate out the material. Um, these assignments here that say anatomy are uh, going to focus more on the structural aspects of uh, muscles, and then the physiology ones will concentrate more on the functional aspects. But really, and the reason why this course is called Anatomy and Physiology, um, <clears throat> we can't entirely separate those two things. So to understand structure, you have to understand what it does. And to understand function, you have to understand what's doing it. Uh, so the two sets of assignments do overlap a bit. But uh, I've tried to make the questions more about structure in this set, more about function in the other set. Um, and there's definitely not a clear uh, separation in the chapter between the two concepts. So I've made all of them do at the same time together. Um, if you'd like to start working on the parts one, two, three stuff to begin with uh, in both groups of assignments and then save the part four stuff until you're done with everything, um, that might be worthwhile. So. Um, Uh, I just want to point out when those things are due. Uh, see, I was um, so I just want to point out one thing in the book. Uh, the first section of the chapter is overview of muscle tissues. And while I'm actually going to talk about a little something that's covered in this section that applies to all the muscle tissues to some extent, um, <clears throat> the picture that you can see here that's really the only picture in this section of the book is just showing the three types of tissue as we see it under the microscope. And that's what we did in lab uh, last time. And um, uh, I recorded. Uh, 
that presentation with the uh, microscope slides that we're looking at. Uh, <clears throat> so I won't cover that here today. We're going to concentrate more on um, getting into skeletal musculature. So I'm going to do that with the um, Prezi presentation. Um, and uh, I am, like I kind of always have been uh, through this course this semester, working to develop these with the voiceover and that sort of thing. Um, and if you were in class uh, before we started, you might have noticed on the screen I was actually editing some of the pictures in this presentation. Um, so I'm, I haven't even gotten to putting this stuff together completely. Uh, and I'm recording today's lecture, so I'll have reference to that. But eventually, it'll make it into the voiceover version of all of this stuff, too. So um, now, uh, for a lot of these, I just pick a sort of a splash picture, a uh, splash page, if you will, to start these off with. Um, but part of the reason why I chose this one, actually, is I want to make this point. I actually said it some yesterday, that I will often use the biceps brachii as a go-to example of a muscle. Um, so this bulge right here represents uh, the belly of that muscle. Um, and so I'll often talk about that. And remember the biceps brachii is responsible for uh, flexing the elbow. So I'll refer to that a bit uh, throughout dealing with the musculature this week and next week. Um, <clears throat> what I want to start with again is sort of the setup, the big picture to some degree for all of this, um, <clears throat> which is to look at the functions of muscles. Sort of tied to that are the characteristics of the muscle tissue. And this is the one thing that's out of that initial uh, section of the chapter that I want to deal with. Um, so all of the comparing the microscope images of the different muscle tissues that we did in lab. Um, <clears throat> There's also this aspect here, which is that all muscle tissues have some common characteristics. Uh, these four things here actually um, go a little bit beyond the book. Uh, the book does not have reference to the first thing in this list, but the other three are in the book. Um, but I think all four of them are, are necessary to talk about what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> Historically, muscle tissue and nervous tissue were always thought of as very similar tissues, and we're going to see, especially when we get to the nervous tissue, uh, nervous system section of the course, that some of the terminology we use to describe muscle tissue is going to be sort of repeated or reflected in talking about nervous tissue. So historically, the two types of tissue have thought to have been very closely related, and part of that comes from the fact uh, that muscle tissue is excitable, um, and nervous tissue is also. Now, when we're talking about excitability, what we mean really is the tissue is uh, <clears throat> responsive to stimuli coming from outside of the tissue or outside of the cells. And generally, that stimulus is an electrical signal. Um, you can take a wire and plug it into a muscle fiber or a nerve fiber and send a little jolt of electricity, and that'll cause either tissue to do something. Um, but we can ex uh, expand that idea of excitability to include chemical signals that will excite the tissue also. Now, I just described sticking a, a wire into the tissue and making the um, muscles do something. There's electrical excitability that <clears throat> interacts with muscle tissue through the nervous system, but in fact, there's not a discharge of electricity from a nerve fiber directly onto a muscle fiber. Instead, there's a chemical signal that's passed through that's the result of a, an electrical signal. And we'll talk about what that means in more detail later on. Uh, but whether it's an electrical signal or a chemical signal, it'll cause the 
muscle tissue to be excited. Um, and that's going to lead to the muscle tissue doing something. Um, we won't talk about cardiac muscle tissue really in any depth until we get to AMP2, but it's a slight exception to this. It is excitable also, but it's actually intrinsically excitable, which means that heart muscle tissue can activate itself, uh, which we're not going to get hung up on that now. It's more important when we're studying how the heart works. But I just do want to lay a little groundwork for you to realize that when we get there, that heart tissue is a little bit different from the other stuff that we're talking about. Now, that excitability leads to the response that we're going to get out of the tissue, which is what contractility is about. Muscle tissue contracts. Um, what we'll see, generally speaking, is the tissue will get shorter. It'll pull in from either side and generate some force in doing that. Muscle contraction generates force to be able to do some sort of work. Now, these things apply to all the different types of muscle tissue. We're going to concentrate on skeletal muscle, muscle this semester, but uh, <clears throat> uh, this is true of cardiac and smooth muscle. So uh, while a muscle can contract like the biceps brachii and flex the elbow, um, <clears throat> smooth muscle can contract and uh, help push food through your digestive tract or um, it can close a sphincter like the opening to your bladder so that you can store urine. Um, and cardiac muscle can contract and that'll cause pumping action from the heart to push blood through your system. So contractility is just referring to muscle tissue in general being able to generate some force as it contracts. Now when we think of contracting we usually think of the tissue getting shorter, uh, sort of pulling in, but muscle tissue is also extensible. We can um, stretch it out a little bit and that's important. If it was only contractible then it would contract and it'd be done doing what it can do, but it has to be extensible also. We have to be able to uh, stretch it out some. Um, if you've ever uh, thrown a baseball or something like that, um, the wind-up part of a pitch, you're actually stretching the muscles out so that when they contract, they can generate quite a bit of force to throw whatever that is. So there has to be that interplay of getting shorter and getting longer, contracting and extending. Um, and whenever you put those two things together, uh, for tissue to be able to last for a long time, uh, it has to be able to move through those two different modes, contracting and extending, over and over again. So muscle tissue is also elastic. Um, there are some tissues that we have that we stretch a little bit and over time, uh, they get a little bit saggier or uh, wrinklier or whatever it might be. They lose their elasticity. Those are usually um, tissues that have as their main component something like collagen, so connective tissues or something like that. But elasticity is a property that we see in a lot of different tissues where we can stretch them out and they go back to their original shape. Um, <clears throat> There's a molecular component within muscle tissue that gives it its elasticity. Um, in other elastic tissues, like elastic cartilage in your external ear, or uh, elastic connective tissue, like in the wall of your aorta, uh, those things stretch out in return because they have uh, their own elastic molecules in them. But there's a particular aspect of muscles that give them elasticity and you don't see muscles eventually wearing out. You don't keep uh, contracting and ex extending them and eventually they lose that ability. They always have that ability because they have an elasticity built into them. Um, so I just want to point out these uh, characteristics of muscle tissue. Like I said in the book, they don't actually address the excitability in that first section. They're just concentrating on contractility, extensibility, of Elasticity. I also want to just uh, give you an overview of the types of functions that we associate with muscles. Uh, again, we're going to concentrate on skeletal muscles this semester, but some of these things apply to um, all three types of tissues. 
Now, producing movement, very general term, terminology there, and so that's certainly going to apply to all of the different types of muscle tissue. Maintaining posture is directed really at skeletal muscle. Not all skeletal muscles are necessary are necessarily going to be involved in maintaining posture, but um, <clears throat> they are what give us the ability to stand upright or sit up or keep our head up or whatever it might be. And to an extent, that's kind of their version of producing movement. We don't think of standing still or keeping your head up as moving. That's sort of thought of as not moving. But it's still the contraction of muscles that makes that possible. Those muscles contract to hold a part of your body in position against the force of gravity. So it's not dynamically moving, but the contraction of the muscle is acting uh, against a particular force. Um, muscles also generate heat. Sorry, did you have a question? Yes, sorry. Um, muscles also generate heat. Uh, if you think about when you're cold, you'll shiver or something like that. Um, and that's, of course, referring to skeletal muscles moving your body. But other muscles will generate heat also. Um, smooth muscle, not quite so much as cardiac or skeletal muscle. But um, the issue is that um, contraction requires energy. And that energy is um, <clears throat> represented in the hydrolysis of ATP molecules. Now, um, I like to assume for a course like this that you have some background in basic biology and chemistry. And I ask several questions over the course of AP1 and 2 that kind of get at what underlies this generating heat thing. Uh, you're probably familiar with the shivering, that kind of thing, and if I ask, how do you maintain your body heat, you're gonna say, oh, you shiver. But really, the basis behind that is a strictly chemical aspect of what's going on. So if muscles have to use a lot of energy in the form of ATP to contract, um, how does that lead to the generation of heat? And I've set you up here that it is a chemical process. But can anybody tell me that? It's the uh, breaking off of the third oxygen. That is what's the providing energy. the power. How does that generate heat? You know, a lot of people just say, it just does. But there's a chemical principle behind that. Why does a chemical reaction like hydrolysis of ATP generate heat? So there's an enzyme that does that, I guess. But, um, it doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with an enzyme doing the work. It's just a general chemical aspect of what's going on there that generates the heat. Any ideas? Does anybody know the chemical term for chemical reactions that generate heat? Yeah, that's all it is. The chemistry we're talking about is exothermic. Exo meaning outside of and thermic, referring to heat energy. So when you break down chemicals, they give off heat. Okay, just a natural process of what's happening here. Um, so as you're describing the um, hydrolysis of ATP, breaking off that third phosphate group, um, you're breaking a chemical bond. And energy is released from that bond when it's broken. A lot of that energy is harnessed to do some sort of uh, biochemical activity in whatever capacity it's used. But it's not a 100% efficient chemical reaction. It's going to give off some heat in doing that. Okay. Now, um, sometimes that will satisfy a lot of students to explain why the heat's pop, uh, released when uh, muscles contract. Contraction requires 
breaking down ATP. But the processes that make ATP also are exothermic. So um, <clears throat> breaking down glucose uh, and uh, giving off carbon dioxide and water as a waste product also gives off heat as a waste product. And that happens in the mitochondria. So making the ATP and using the ATP, all of those chemical reactions are exothermic and they all give off heat. Okay. Um, I read a book a while back about mitochondria um, in some detail and it talks about you know where they came from and all of the finer points of what they do. It's really an interesting book for you know, a science geek like me. Um, but they did discuss in there something that I wasn't really aware of and doesn't get talked about a whole lot. But when you t think about what the mitochondrion does, you usually think, oh, it's uh, the powerhouse of the cell. It makes ATP. Okay. But what it really does is it goes through a rather complex chemical process to harvest protons and electrons out of biomolecules. And those protons are forced across a membrane, and the only way they can get back across when you build up the concentration gradient is through a um, molecule that makes ATP, okay. uh, sort of like a turnstile. So if you pack everybody into a room and the only way they can get out is through a turnstile, and every time one person comes out and it pushes that turnstile around, that generates some energy. That's essentially what ATP synthesis is. But mitochondria can actually detach the uh, concentration gradient of protons from ATP synthesis and just burn glucose, essentially. And all of the energy that's released doing that generates heat. Okay. So shivering for muscles takes advantage of the exothermic reactions um, <clears throat> inherent in making and using ATP. But it also might be possible, which is getting away from muscles a little bit, that mitochondria uh, can purposely be very inefficient and give off all of the energy that they harvest from glucose as heat, which will help keep our bodies warm. And then finally here we have storage and movement of substances and organ systems. Now this is stated purposely to be a very general statement because um, <coughs> It does apply to all three different types of muscle tissue, but exactly how the different muscle tissues do that varies. Um, <clears throat> cardiac muscle uh, obviously moves blood through the body. When the heart pumps, it pushes blood through everything. Um, but in the exact components of what's happening during the heartbeat, uh, blood is stored in different areas of the heart and then moved on in a certain order. So it kind of uh, goes with that easily. Um, smooth muscle is a lot easier to think of here. Um, you store food in your stomach uh, because a sphincter muscle closes off and keeps it there before, you know, while it's being digested there. And then other muscles push that food on through the small intestine or something. Um, and we could say the same thing for um, uh, the urinary system or uh, the reproductive system or whatever. There's a lot of examples of smooth muscle being involved in storing and moving things through uh, organ systems. Um, when we think of organ systems, we usually think primarily of smooth muscle and then we have to consider cardiac muscle for the cardiovascular system, or the, the heart specifically. Um, but we can also make this statement in terms of skeletal muscle. Um, we usually think of skeletal muscle as just being important for moving our bodies around, but um, it's also important in driving breathing. So if we think of the substance in the statement as being air, um, our diaphragm and some other skeletal muscles are involved in breathing air in, storing it in your lungs while gases exchange with the blood, and then uh, moving it out. Um, so 
again, a very general statement, but if we sort of interpret some specifics, we can uh, show how all three different types of muscle tissue do that. So as we're talking about the skeletal muscles, consider how they actually kind of do some of all of these things. And then we'll see uh, for cardiac tissue when we get to the heart and smooth muscle and a number of other organ systems, uh, how they uh, play a role in most of these things. Um, maintaining posture isn't really much about the other types of muscle tissue. And smooth muscle does very little to generate heat. And cardiac muscle, while it's going to potentially generate heat, also is a very small amount of the muscle tissue in your body and doesn't really have a whole lot to do with um, its direct control over body temperature. So, so mo most of maintaining posture generating heat we associate with skeletal muscles. So. Um, <clears throat> oh. uh, I forgot to take this out of the um, pathway that I'm, I'm going through here. This is what we did in the lab yesterday and I typed it up on the screen, uh, essentially this same, same list. Um, so you can get that out of the presentation from yesterday's lab. Um, so I want to move on to talking about um, skeletal muscle directly, which is what we're going to concentrate on for the rest of this chapter. I think the very end of the chapter might go into cardiac and smooth muscle in a little bit more detail, but we're not going to go back to that beyond uh, the basic functionality I just talked about and then the differences in what we see under the microscope that I talked about in lab yesterday. Um, I'm not going to deal with the other types of muscle tissue just yet. Uh, we're going to save most of that for AP2. Uh, so instead we're just going to concentrate on skeletal muscle for the rest of this chapter. And uh, we're going to start by looking at um, the structure of the muscle as an organ. And um, I'm doing things a little bit differently than I normally do. Uh, I'm going to try to keep with how the book presents this, uh, <clears throat> which is a little bit off from the way I usually do it. But the way I usually do it, there's this thing that I have to kind of throw in at one point that gets a little awkward. And I think uh, I want to try the way the book does it and see if it's a little bit uh, <laughs> more natural progression, but of course that means uh, I might not feel so natural going through it in that order. So, Now the first thing uh, to talk about is just the structure of the muscle as an organ. And as, uh, we talked about with other organ systems, um, organs are made up of all sorts of different tissues. Okay. Now there is a potential confusing point as we're moving through this that um, <clears throat> muscle tissue and muscle as an organ are both referred to as muscle. Um, and you really kind of have to just get a feel for the context of where we're using that term. So if I'm talking about uh, the muscles attached to your bone, then obviously I'm talking about the organs. But if I'm talking about um, the contraction of skeletal muscle, sometimes I'm talking just about what's happening in the muscle tissue itself, um, which applies to the organ, but uh, if we're talking just about the act of contraction, uh, what's important is the tissue that's doing that. So you have to sort of get a feel for its context. Um, so two skeletal muscles as organs. Um, they're made up of a bunch of different tissues uh, we're going to obviously pay a lot of attention to the skeletal muscle tissue, but here I want to highlight some connective tissue that's important with how the muscles are organized. We're not going to look directly at uh, the role that epithelial tissue plays, um, because really the epithelial tissue within a muscle as an organ is the walls of blood vessels. That's where we see uh, epithelial tissue there. And then a little later on we'll talk about its relation to the nervous tissue that's connected to muscles. Um, but uh, here we're just going to uh, concentrate on the connective tissues that help organize the muscle tissue within the muscle as an organ. And this picture showing sort of three levels of organization gets at a um, 
sort of repeating motif, if you will, theme, schematic, I don't know what words best to describe it, um, and how the organ is organized. Um, there's a large, in this case, rather roundish looking thing, and different muscles that have different shapes, but just like in the basic muscle here. Um, that's really a bundle of some smaller round structures. Um, so the entire muscle is contained within a layer of connective tissue called the epimycin, which is at the top center of the, the frame here. Uh, epi basically means on top of or around, um, and then mys, M-Y-S, is the root that means muscle. Uh, this is a Greek word, so it's the Greek root for muscle. Um, and Greek doesn't really have a letter Y per se, um, but as we take Greek words and make them into English words, uh, we use a Y in this particular position. Uh, the same sort of process where Greek words were introduced into Latin, um, the change was a little bit different. So the Y that we see here from the Greek root that means muscle um, gets changed into a U when it becomes a, a Latin root. So M-U-S, uh, which is obviously the root of muscle, is just directly from the M-Y-S that's the root of, that means muscle in Greek. Interestingly, um, the Latin word M-U-S, which is the root for muscle, is also the word that means mouse. And you can probably see how M-O-U-S-E, Mickey Mouse, no, um, comes from, I should probably pay royalties to Disney for throwing that into my presentation. But um, anybody, anybody, come on, too early in the morning for jokes? M-O-U-S-E so, um, and M-U-S obviously are connected. That's where we get the word uh, mouse. Um, I've never bothered to actually uh, verify this. Um, it's sort of worked its way up to kind of legendary explanation that the reason why the root for the word muscle is the word mouse is that um, the bulging bellies of muscles as people are flexing uh, joints and that sort of thing look like uh, mice running underneath the skin. Whether that's true or not, I really don't know. And it doesn't really fit in the fact that the Greek root that gives rise to the uh, Latin root is really the same word, and I don't know what the Greek word for mouse is, uh, but um, <clears throat> at least from the, the Latin level on, the word for mouse and the word for or the root for muscle are actually the same thing, um, and it might very well be that story that I just told you is true, but I've never really verified, and I don't know if anybody can verify that kind of explanation of where a word ultimately came from originally. So, but epimysium is referring to the outer covering around the entire muscle. It's a dense, irregular connective tissue. Now you can see in this picture, they kind of peeled back a little bit, um, so you can see it's, it doesn't have any inherent properties like color to itself, except when it uh, extends back along the length of the muscle, eventually the muscle blends into the tendon and the tendon is made up partly of the uh, <clears throat> tissue that was the epimysium. It's no longer called the epimysium once we get to the tissue, to the tendon, but it's really the same tissue. Um, and I'll come back to talking about the tendon a little bit more because a little bit later because there's more to talk about um, <clears throat> connective tissue that relates. Um, so what we have extending out from this whole muscle here is what's called a fascicle. The word fascicle generally means a group of fibers. Um, and we'll actually see that there are muscle fascicles and nerve fascicles. Like I said, historically muscle and nerve tissue were uh, <clears throat> thought of as very similar stuff. So if you look at a, a nerve, you'll see bundles of nerve fibers that are called fascicles just like bundles of muscle fibers are called a fascicle here. And so really a muscle is just a big bundle of bundles of fibers. So 
uh, we're going to see the sort of repeating structural uh, approach here um, in that the whole muscle here is made up of a bunch of things all bundled together and those things that are all bundled together are bundles of smaller fibers inside of them. So um, if we move down from the fascicle that's extending out of the whole muscle here, looking at just a fascicle, it's surrounded by its own layer of connective tissue, which is called the perimysium. And peri means around. So this is the um, layer of connective tissue that surrounds a fascicle. Um, it is also dense, irregular connective tissue, just like the other ones. And it extends along the whole length of the fascicle, and the fascicle is going to run the whole length of the uh, muscle, and the paramyceum is going to extend from the muscle into the tendon. So I was saying a second ago that the epimyceum extends into the tendon also. The epimyceum extends to be essentially the outer part of the tendon, and then the inner part of the tendon is made up of all of the paramyceum that's extending past the muscle fascicle. <clears throat> the epimyceum and perimyceum is dense irregular connective tissue within the structure of the muscle, and they both extend into the tendon. The tendon is dense regular connective tissue, but it is essentially the same tissue that was the epi and perimyceum. The only difference between regular and irregular is the arrangement of collagen fibers. In dense regular connective tissue, which is a tendon, all of the collagen fibers are running in parallel. Dense irregular connective tissue, like the paramyceum and epimyceum, the, connective, the collagen fibers are running in all sorts of different directions. Um, they're surrounding everything with an, a mesh or a network of collagen fibers holding a muscle for the fascicle together. And those collagen fibers, as they uh, sort of reach, some of them reach the end of the muscle, are going to then all line up in parallel and make up the structure of the tendon. Where does the tendon end up connecting? To a bone. To a bone. What's a bone covered in? What do we call the outer covering of a bone? What's the root that means bone? Osteo. Osteo. Okay. So that's the root of this word. Hmm? What do we call the outer covering of a bone? What surrounds a bone? Periosteum. Right. Periosteum. What type of tissue is the fibrous part of periosteum? Dense. Dense. Irregular. Dense, irregular. <laughs> What's the rest of that? Connective. Connective tissue, yeah. Which is the same as the epi and perimyceum. Okay. Really, all of those tissues are just one continuous sheet of tissue. Okay. There's dense, irregular connective tissue surrounding the muscle and the fascicles that all come together to be dense, regular tissue as a tendon, which then directly becomes dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the bone. Collagen fibers can probably be traced from the epimyceum through the tendon into the paramyceum, sorry, periosteum, um, or through the paramyceum tendon and into the periosteum. Okay. Continuous collagen fibers because it's all connected together, and that's how the muscles stay connected to the bones. In this picture, we don't see the tendon connecting to the bone. Uh, that's just happening. Um, so now we're looking at the middle picture here, and we see again a kind of roundish structure, which is our fascicle now, and within it are smaller roundish structures, um, and one of those extends out from there. And those uh, individual things that make up the fascicle are the individual muscle fibers, um, which can also be referred to as myofibers, myo just meaning muscle. Um, so muscle fiber, myofiber, same thing. They are a muscle cell. Okay. Um, individual muscle fibers are surrounded by 
another layer of connective tissue called the endomycium. Endo meaning within. So this is a layer of connective tissue that's deep within uh, the structure of the muscle as an organ. This is areolar connective tissue. So paramycium and epimycium are dense irregular connective tissues, both of which end up becoming the tendon, which end up merging into the periosteum. Endomycium is uh, areolar connective tissue surrounding each individual muscle fiber because there needs to be blood vessels and nerve fibers getting directly to each nerve fiber. So they don't quite have all that drawn in here, but these two bluish purple lines represent blood vessels that need to be right next to the, to the muscle fiber um, to supply it with oxygen and glucose and carry waste products away. Um, it's not represented in this picture, but it is true that there are also going to be um, nerve fibers that are coming in here. We'll look at the nerve fibers a little later on uh, because they provide information to the muscle fiber telling it when to contract. And for those to get up to the muscle fiber, there needs to be a little loose connective tissue around it with the space for the blood vessels and the nerve fibers to get to. And that's the endosteum, I mean the endomycium. <laughs> now, um, if we look at just a muscle fiber by itself down here, um, we see that it's still kind of the same structural idea. Um, it's a fairly round object with a bunch of smaller round objects bundled inside of it. Now we're looking at a single cell, so what we're looking at inside of it are organelles. And muscle fibers have a unique, or I shouldn't say well, yeah, unique's a fine word. A specialized organelle called a myofibril. Okay. Um, now you might hear myofiber, and that's just another word for muscle fiber or muscle cell. Myofibril is referring to an organelle within a muscle fiber, which is the thing that actually does the contraction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go on to the next picture in a second, which has basically this picture at the bottom repeated. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to point out one thing that they have labeled here, which is sarcolemma off the side. Um, now, um, in this picture of just the, mu the muscle fiber, they don't represent the endomycium surrounding it. They're just showing us itself. And what's sort of cut away here uh, as the outer covering of the cell is the cell membrane. And that's what we call the sarcolemma. Um, for some reason, the scientists that originally studied muscle tissue started making up their own specialized names for parts of the cells um, that were unique to muscle cells. But they're really, for the most part, um, things that all cells have. So what do you think the sarcolemma really is? The cell membrane, which I actually just said in a second ago seeing if people are paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, but the word sarcolemma is actually a variation of a very old word that we use to, use to say cell membrane. So cell membranes used to and still kind of are called plasma membranes also. Um, the term plasma mem membrane is uh, somewhat falling out of use and cell membranes the more common one mostly because the word plasma uh, the reason why that was used to refer to this doesn't entirely make sense in the modern uh, set of usage when you hear plasma you probably more think of you know the liquid component of blood or something like that um, so calling it the plasma membrane is a little bit uh, old-fashioned but plasma membrane was actually the modern term uh, that replaced a very old term, which was plasma lemma. And um, so the people that studied muscle tissue originally thought, hey, we're going to talk about the plasma lemma of the muscle cell, so we're going to call that sarcolemma. And we'll see in a lot of situations, well, not a lot, but like three or four different situations, that there will be words that have sarco 
something in them. And the sarco there is referring to uh, muscle tissue. So it'll, they'll just take a common name for something else and they'll uh, replace part of one of the words with sarco and that'll just mean it's that common thing but specifically for a muscle tissue, for a muscle cell. So sarcolemma instead of plasma lemma means cell membrane of a muscle cell. Um, sarco is a root that means flesh. Okay. Um, again, we're working with Greek words for the most part here. So sarco, yeah, um, sarco means flesh in Greek. Um, and the only relatively modern usage of that uh, root that I can ever think of um, that anybody might have heard of is really kind of obscure is uh, sarcophagus. Has anybody heard of that before? Sarcophagus. Anybody know what a sarcophagus is? Hmm? So what is it? It's like a casket. Usually when you think of sarcophagus you think of a big sort of stone mausoleum kind of casket. You know, if you've seen uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. That kind of thing. Um, does anybody know what sarcophagus actually translates to mean? Does anybody know what phago means? Eat or swallow, like the esophagus. Sarcophagus means to eat flesh. It's literally what it means. And if you put a body in a box and you come back later and look at it and all the flesh is gone, if you didn't understand decomposition and microbes, you'd say, hey, the box ate all the flesh. So that's where the word came from. It means flesh eater. Would it be the same thing with sarcoma? Isn't that really good? So, uh, kind of. <laughs> um, the thing about sarco meaning flesh is that that's a fairly general term and it doesn't always mean muscle. And so there are sarcomas which are actually skin uh, tumors. And so in that case, it's flesh in the sense of skin rather than in the sense of muscle tissue. But um, <clears throat> if the flesh eating box wasn't gross enough, let's go a little bit further with this. Um, if you go and get, you know, uh, drumsticks from KFC or something like that, you're eating the flesh of an animal, okay? but you're eating its muscle tissue. Okay. Um, and uh, so that's in the sense of flesh being muscle tissue. That's where it comes from. It comes from. And then um, they label up here mitochondrion, and you can see a mitochondrion here, and there's several more scattered mixed in among the myofibrils. Um, why are my, mitochondria so important to what, understanding what muscles do? Well, we were talking about them because of what they do to generate heat, but more importantly for muscles to do the job. So they, how are they connected to contraction? They have to be there because muscles contract, but what do they do that makes contraction possible? Or what do mitochondria do? Make ATP. Make ATP. And ATP is necessary to power contraction. So we have to have a lot of mitochondria mixed in with everything, making ATP so that everything can happen. Um, now, uh, I'll get back to the other couple of things that are labeled of, on the muscle fiber because we want to talk about what's at the bottom of this a bit more. Um, so they have a section of a myofibril laid out down here. And before we talk about the myofibril itself, I want to point out what's wrapped around it. Right? Now, they only show what's wrapped around it extending a little ways down the myofibril, but really the whole myofibril will be covered in this. Um, and this is what's called the, called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. Now, uh, like I said, it's common in a lot of things having to do with muscle cells that a name has sarco in it to represent that it's part of the muscle cell, but it's really just taking the name of something that all cells have. So what is the sarcoplasmic reticulum for any given cell? 
What's the common name for what that is? Right, it's the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, is all endoplasmic reticulum the same? How, what are differences in endoplasmic reticulum? Yeah, so we have two types, smooth and rough. What is rough endoplasmic reticulum? Yeah, it has ribosomes on it. What is smooth endoplasmic reticulum? So just to mirror the right to mirror the definition we just gave, smooth endoplasmic reticulum is smooth because it doesn't have ribosomes on it. Which gets at what is endoplasmic reticulum? Surprisingly, the name actually tells you what it is if you can decipher what the name means. Okay. So <clears throat> endo means what? Inside. Plasma, I said a little bit ago, used to be used to refer to what? Now, now we mostly refer to what? To the cell membrane. Okay. But really it's a membrane, a phospholipid bilayer membrane. So an endoplasmic, uh, well endoplasmic is referring to uh, membranes within the cell. Okay. And then what does reticulum mean? Can you think of another place that we've, in this course, not today, but previously, that we've used a word very like reticulum? Maybe three or four chapters ago? Another thing that we've talked about in this class that has a word very similar to reticulum. Right, reticular tissue. Why is reticular tissue called reticular tissue? <laughs> and what does reticular mean? No? So, um, it's a good starting point to get to the definition of reticular. The reason why reticular tissue is called reticular tissue is usually because it contains reticular fibers, which doesn't really help define the word at all. But reticular fibers are called reticular fibers because they look like all of these branching things there. But when you have a bunch of branching fibers, they make up a mesh or a network. And that's what reticular really means. Okay. So endoplasmic reticulum just means internal membrane network. That's what it means. Okay. Now, rough endoplasmic reticulum, because it's covered with ribosomes, is most directly involved in what process in a cell? What do ribosomes do? They don't make RNA. They use RNA to make something else. Proteins, Proteins right. So, rough endoplasmic reticulum, because it's covered with ribosomes, is very important for protein synthesis. And the endoplasmic reticulum part is just that the proteins that are made by those ribosomes go into this membrane enclosed network and they can move <coughs> through the cell to some degree. And usually rough ER interacts with the Golgi apparatus which ends up transporting proteins to the cell membrane or excreting them uh, like hormones or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's what rough ER does because okay, it has ribosomes. But the smooth ER is an internal network of membrane space that stores things. What kind of things are stored within the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? Any ideas? <coughs> Possibly. I don't know that that's necessarily true, but uh, it does get to the point that it's possible in any cell that a certain cell might store ATP in one place. I actually kind of doubt it because um, I usually characterize ATP in a cell as like Oreos at my house. If they're there, they're going to get used up. 
So putting it in the pantry doesn't really help. So uh, you don't really store ATP in and of itself because if it's there, it gets burned up, used up. Because there's a lot of things going on in any cell that uses ATP. Um, but <clears throat> the two major types of things that you tend to find stored in smooth ER are lipids and calcium. And in muscle tissue, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the smooth ER of the muscle cell, is storing calcium. And calcium is going to be very important for what the myofibril does. So that gets us to the myofibril. The reason why we're looking at just the myofibril here pulled out of the cell is because we want to look a little bit of what its detail is. Um, it's really a bundle of fibrous proteins and in a way it's sort of an, uh, an adaptation of the cytoskeleton of the muscle cell. Okay. Um, the cytoskeleton in any cell is going to help give it some shape and it might have something to do with how the cell moves or um, how things inside the cell are connected to each other or something like that. And that's kind of what the myofibril does, but it does it in a way that also produces contractile force. Now, the myofibril is really a repeating series of the exact same arrangement of fibers. And one unit within that, one thing that repeats over and over again, is bracketed out here called the sarcomere. Again, sarco, that root that's used to describe things in muscle cells. Mere at the end of this is just an uh, ending in Greek words uh, <coughs> that kind of means unit. Um, a word that you're probably familiar with that uses that is polymer okay, or monomer which goes with polymer. A polymer is a chain of repeating units. Okay. Um, Usually when you hear polymer, you think of plastics or rubber or something like that, which are made up of repeating units of uh, usually um, petroleum-based products, which means lipids. Um, but a uh, protein, for instance, is a polymer that's a repeating series of amino acids. Or starch is a polymer made up of repeating glucose molecules. So polymer just means many things repeated. Monomer is a single unit, one amino acid within the polymer of a protein, or one glucose molecule within a starch molecule. So the sarcomere is one unit within the myofibril, and it's just a repeating pattern of these uh, fibrous proteins. Now the two main components that make up the um, sarcomere structure are called the thin filament and the thick filament. The thick filament is a protein called myosin. Um, and we'll look at its structure in a little bit. And then the thin filament is primarily made up of a protein called actin. Um, and if you're familiar with cytoskeleton in general for other cells, actin is an important part of any cytoskeleton. And so here we see that it gets used specifically to make up this component called the thin film. The thin film actually has a couple of other things attached to it, which we'll look at in a second. But in this picture, the thin filaments are represented by these thin lines, which I think are green. Is this green? Yeah. I have a Y chromosome, and therefore some problems with color. Um, not that all Y chromosomes do, but I inherited the color lines. Um, and then the thick filaments here, which again are myosin, uh, line up. The two types of filaments, thin filaments and thick filaments, overlap with, with each other. But then there's a, a region beyond the thin filament, or I mean, sorry, beyond the thick filament where we just have thin filament. And there's a region where the thin filament ends coming from either side, we just have thick filament. So they're, they're overlapping, but they're not completely overlapping. And that'll be important to understand what's happening here. A few other things to point out that we see in this picture. Um, the boundary of the sarcomere 
is made up of what's called a z-disk. And it's a zigzag line as it's drawn here, which is a great way to represent something called a z-disk. Um, it's just a bunch of little filament proteins that connect all of the thin filaments together. So you can see that the green lines of the thin filaments end at a point where some of the short lines that make up the z-disk come together. And it's sort of like the z-disk zigs and zags back and forth. And with one zig, they had a, a thin filament going into this sarcomere, and then it zags back and connects the thin filament going into the next sarcomere. So it's the boundary between two sarcomeres, and attached to it are the thin filaments extending into towards the center of either sarcomere that it's a boundary. Also, there's a uh, line down the middle, which is oh, labeled over here, called the M line. Now, really, the way that they depicted it in this picture, there's three lines, but collectively, uh, it's the M line. It's the middle of the circuit. Okay, so the Z disks on either side, uh, and the M line down the middle. Uh, the M line basically acts like an anchor point to hold the thick filaments in place so that they're centered within the circuit. Okay. Um, Now the rest of what's labeled here are the A band and I band that we see at the bottom and the H zone that we see labeled kind of at the top. Um, the A band brackets really the thick filaments. And it represents where we have all of the thick filaments kind of lining up together. And then the I band, that bracket goes from the end of one thick filament crosses over the z-lip disc to the end of the thick filament in the adjoining circuit. Basically, the A-band represents where we have myosin, where the thin, thick filaments are, and the I-band represents where we do not have myosin, where the thick filaments are not. Don't think that the I-band is where there's thin filament. There is the thin filament in the I-band, but there's thin filament in the a band also. So just A band is where there's a thick filament, I band is where there's not a thick filament. Now the reason why they're called I and A band is because the A band stains darkly. So it makes a dark stripe across the um, muscle fiber. And the I band stains lightly. So it's the uh, light band that you see between the dark bands which is the striations that we looked at in lab yesterday. So that alternating dark and light pattern that we see on striated tissue, which is skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, um, is because they have within them these myofibrils, which we're going to see are the, the cause of contraction. And the thick filaments being thick are going to stain darker than the uh, thin filaments. And so where we don't see thick filaments, we have a light staining, and where we do see the thick filaments, we have a dark stain. Now the H zone is not something that you actually see under the microscope unless it's a really, really well stained section, but it's where the thick filament is not overlapping with the thin filament in the middle. See, that bracket kind of goes from the tip of one thin filament to the tip of the other thin filament. The H zone is just where there's no thin filaments, but there is a thick filament. If you have it stained very well, you can actually see in the dark band a light, slightly lighter center, center stripe that is uh, that H zone. Okay. Uh, but it's highly unlikely that you'd actually see that under the microscope because the staining has to be really good and the magnification factor has to be really high to see that detail. I used to have a book, or um, the book that we used as a department before uh, the other book that all of my colleagues are using and making their students pay for, and I'm now using this book. But the, the book we used as a department before that had a picture of muscle tissue stain that was really, 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 really detailed. Okay. In that you could see all of this stuff. You could see the Z disc, you could see the H zone, you could see all that stuff. And it was actually a little bit dis, uh, 
problematic for students because they thought that they should be able to see that in, under the microscope when they looked at that muscle tissue. But you can't. All you would see under the microscope are alternating light dark bands. Because we just don't work with the kind of magnification factor that you have to see all of that. Um, and that's all that it is. The light bands are the I bands where there's no thick filament, and the dark bands are the A bands where there is thick filament. And they stain darkly because myosin, being a thick filament, picks up more stain. So that part of the muscle of the um, myofibril stains darker. Now, each one of these little circles here represents a myofibril. But the I and A bands span all the way across the muscle fiber. And that's because all of the myofibrils are lined up together. So, um, Everything within the muscle fiber is organized such that all of the uh, thick filaments in one myofibril line up with the thick filaments in the next myofibril, which line up with the thick filaments in the next myofibril. And you just see all of those across the entire my muscle fiber under the microscope because of how they stain. Now this picture gets at the structure of the thick and thin filaments in a little bit more detail, just showing what these muscles look like. Now, um, I want to uh, sort of demonstrate these to some degree, which is not going to help with the recording too well, because I'm going to show you some stuff here in class, which won't make it, oh my gosh, I hurt my back a little bit. Here we go. Okay. So I'm going to use these bendy things to suggest the structure of these fibrous proteins. So myosin is um, a fibrous protein that's made up of two um, individual proteins that have a kind of golf club shape to them. They have a head piece and then a tail piece. So look kind of like a golf club. Um, two of these get wrapped together, and I think I'm, I used to have a second thick one of these things on the cart, but apparently it's not on the cart anymore. So uh, I'm just going to fold this in half, so we have two head pieces here. And then the tail of the two things kind of wrap together. Okay. So this is what one myosin filament looks like. And then you take a bunch of myosin filaments and bundle them all together with the head part sticking out like this. And you get a thick filament. Okay. Now the thick filament actually has two sides too. So some of the myosin filaments are arranged like this with their heads sticking out here on this half of the um, thick filament from the M line to the end. And the others are oriented the exact opposite way with their heads sticking up this way. And actually where the um, M line is in the middle, there aren't little head pieces sticking off. They're just overlapping tail pieces that make up the thickness of that bundle. So that's what's going on in the thick filament. It's all just myosin filaments like this. The thin filaments are a little bit more detailed, or a little bit more complex. Um, they're mainly based on the structure of a protein called actin. And the actin gene makes a little globular protein, which is represented by these little green things that kind of look like pit of olives. See the pit of olive? Um, so that's one actin subunit. And they get chained together like a necklace, a beaded necklace. And then two beaded necklaces of acted subunits twirl together to make a filament like this. And this is the basis of the thin film, which is uh, the strands of actin subunits. Now I described them in this picture looking kind of like pitted olives. Um, the opening where the pit was remote, removed from the olive, um, that dark circle there, it's not really a hole in the thing. That I was described in the picture of green and looks like that little shadow in the middle. But actually, that's a dot that's on the actin subunit, which is called the myosin binding site.
And the head units in the myosin molecule can make a physical connection and bind to the actin subunits. Okay. That's what those binding sites are for. But as you can see here, they're all covered by this fiber strand right here, which is a molecule called tropomyosin. So it's a thinner little filament that wraps around the actin filaments. So there's sort of two series, and if I had a thinner little bendy thing here, I'd add it to my model. But they just wrap around the thin filament, covering up those binding sites. Now every so often, there's a, a little uh, added thing here, which is a molecule called troponin. Now troponin is actually a little bit more complex than this picture gives it credit for, but it's um, a protein that's found occasionally along the length of the thin filament that interacts with tropomyosin. What we're going to see is tropomyosin covers those binding sites when the muscle's relaxed. And when the muscle contracts, troponin is going to move tropomyosin out of the way so that myosin can bind with actin. Okay. Now, that story t is going to take a little bit of time to get to, but that's where we're going to see this structure plays into things. Um, any question about the molecular structure here in the thick and thin filaments? <clears throat> then we're going to talk next about how the nervous system is connected to these things. And uh, I certainly need more than a minute to talk about that. So this is where we'll pick up next time and we'll continue talking about the structure of the muscle and uh, the tissues that make up the whole organ. So.